Uh, okay. Um, so just a bit of an agenda for the talk. Um, be starting off with some introductions and objectives. Uh, we'll then be going on to um, three live demos, uh, just because I like a bit of a challenge. And uh, we'll be then moving on to think about how you can look at your own use cases, come up with some ideas for your own use cases in your own businesses. And then when you come to implement those use cases, uh, I've got some thoughts on some best practices when it comes to generative AI based on my own uh, experiences to date. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with a bit of Q&A as well, or equally happy to take questions in the pub afterwards. Uh, so as Sam said already, uh, I work as a security architect at Santander UK. I've uh, been there for about 16 months, and that's part of a broader career journey of, uh, as Sam said again, nearly 20 years, uh, where I started out as a consultant with Deloitte Cybersecurity Practice, uh, moved on to be a contractor for a few years, um, working across various financial services um, and other industries. Um, and then more recently, um, I was the global security architect for Costa Coffee um, and uh, uh, bringing right up to date uh, with joining Santander uh, last year. Uh, and when I'm not working, um, I have a few different hobbies to keep things interesting. Um, so I live on a 10-acre small holding in North Buckinghamshire. Um, so at my weekends, uh, I'm shearing sheep um, and rounding up any escaped pigs that happen to be about on the, on the farm. Um, and I also enjoy um, tinkering away in my home lab. Um, so you'll find various assortments of like, Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and things. Um, and that kind of necessitates some coding. Um, and that's some of what's brought me to um, generative AI as well, because I found that what used to take me a couple of days, I can now do in a couple of hours. Um, and I've tried to extrapolate that to see how we can how we can apply it in business and how we can get those benefits across uh, a, a broader set of people. Um, so the objectives for this talk: um, number one, show you some tools, give you some ideas, um, and hopefully raise some awareness of the, the practical applications um, for this uh, this generative AI technology that's been in the news so much. Um, what I'm not going to talk about, it's not going to be an intro to generative AI. I think there's probably been enough out there in the news, the media and other talks doing like gener generative AI 101. Um, I'm not going to talk about the security risks associated with LLMs. Um, please go and look at the OWASP top 10 uh, for LLMs released this week. It's a great resource for that. Um, I'm also not going to cover, as part of the use cases, um, the, the chat with documents uh, use cases that you'll see, which is, you know, I give a set of documents to create a custom knowledge base, and I chat with those documents to get answers. Um, those, don't get me wrong, those are incredibly valuable, and I think really useful, um, and loads of organizations will be doing that, um, but today I wanted to push the envelope a little bit to show you what I've been experimenting with. Okay, so um, use case number one. Um, Threat modeling, uh, this is something that I know from experience. Um, when you have a security professional in the room, it can go really well. Um, if you don't have a security professional there, I've seen fairly mixed results. Um, sometimes application development teams, um, unless they've been to the process before, don't necessarily understand or really get to the depth of what's required. And so what I started to think about was is there a way that we can use generative AI to provide almost like a security person in the room um, for, for those developers? And so that's when I, I came up with um, Stride GPT. Um, so sort of looking behind the scenes, and, and we'll demo the tool in, in a little while, the things that I think make this interesting from a generative AI standpoint um, is that we're not using um, a chat GPT-like interface. So it's not a chat interface model. What we're doing, or what I'm doing, is taking um, a number of values that we capture from the user, so an application description, uh, the types of authentication methods for the application, etc., and we're stuffing that into a broader prompt template, and it's that prompt template that provides the consistency of the threat modeling experience 
So you don't, you know, you may have encountered some of this when you've used ChatGPT when you ask it to take on a specific persona, like be a security expert, be a marketing SEO expert. But you always have to um, sort of prepend your query with with that. The benefit of using these prompt templates is that the user doesn't have to think about any of that. They just have to put in their their application description, stuff they know, um, and the the application will take care of the rest. Um, so then we, as I said, we take all of that information uh, along with uh, the, the prompt template and we pass that as a formatted prompt to the, the OpenAI API in this case. Um, and uh, another, another interesting feature that I wanted to call out was more recently, as I've been adding more functionality in, I've then been trying to improve the consistency of the outputs that I get back from the language model. So unless you're quite specific, um, one of the joys of working with LLMs, and in fact, as we might see demoing LLMs, is that you'll never get the same response twice um, unless you work pretty hard at your prompt engineering. Um, and that can be down to like, individual words, or it can be the entire structure. So if I ask it to create a threat model, uh, on one hand, it will produce a very nice structured report. The next time around, it might produce something uh, quite different. And that's where, as we'll go on to look at the code, um, and you can look at the code on my um, GitHub repos, you'll see that there's quite a lot of effort gone into the prompts to um, push the, the language model down a certain direction when it comes to formatting the output. And the latest thing I've added is this, um, this use of JSON objects. So by using that, and it turns out that um, the OpenAI models are amazingly good at, at JSON, actually. Um, you can then get the, the outputs back in a structured format, which means you can pass them out later on, which is incredibly useful, as, as you'll see. Um, you can play with the app as well. Um, if, if you want to, please don't all go there at once, just while I'm demoing it. Um, I don't know what the streamlit cap is, but um, we'll have a look at that now, anyway. OK, um, yep, so that's definitely big enough. Um, so there's a couple of things that you need to provide. Um, one is your, your OpenAI uh, API key, um, and also the model that you want to use. Um, for this demo, we'll use GPT 3.5 Turbo, um, because it's just a bit quicker than GPT 4. Um, but that model is available for you to select as well. And then this is the, the information that we provide about our application, um, just for demo purposes and getting people quickly up and running, I provide an example application description um, that we can use. Um, and this is a fairly you know, straightforward description. You can go into more detail when you're doing it yourself. Um, the application retains uh, no data. I don't log anything on the back end. You can look at the code. Um, but generally, with large language models, you'll find that the more you put in, the more you'll get out. Because what you're doing by providing the additional context is you're triggering different parts of that model um, to then be able to retrieve and give you the benefit uh, of that later on. So you see we're describing the application, um, a React front end, Node.js back end, MongoDB. Um, we're using uh, OAuth 2. Uh, and we've made some notes that it's a, it's a note-taking and sharing application. Um, so nothing you know, revolutionary. Uh, so we know it's a web app already, but there is the ability to select uh, different options. It is, of course, internet facing. And I've, I've had some feedback when uh, from people that have used this to say, you know, could you change it to be the modern, uh, the current government classification scheme? It's not what I'm trying to do with this. Um, it's really just to give an indication to the language model of how sensitive the data might be. Um, and so you, know, you could even put non in here and then add your own additional description up top um, if you've got your own classification scheme. But it seems to work um, fairly well, and it, it's sort of generic enough for the language model to understand. Uh, so we did say we had OAuth 2. We'll also say we've got basic authentication. Uh, and we'll say that we're not storing our uh, privileged accounts in a PAM tool. Uh, so the first step is we'll go and generate our threat model. So again, this, is, this isn't trying to be you know, perfect on the first try. 
it's really uh, trying to give people a leg up on the threat modeling process and to hopefully get them to understand um, what we mean as security professionals when we talk about threat modeling. Um, so we now have our, uh, our stride threat model. We'll zoom out a little bit. So you see it's picked up each of the threat types. Uh, it's then generated a scenario, and it's picking up some of the information that we provided. So it is pulling in the relative context um, to, to provide that into our threat list. Uh, and then we've got a description of the potential impact as well. What I've also asked the model to do um, is, in order to get more benefit from this as people use it more, is to provide some improvement suggestions to the user, which says, you could improve your application description, uh, and if you do that, I'll be able to provide you with more detail, more value. Um, and so that's what this section is doing here. And you've got the ability to download the outputs uh, in a markdown format. What we can also then do, though, is we can generate some, uh, some potential mitigations for those threats that have just been identified. So this is where we're then taking that list of threats that was produced, and we're looking for the first um, part of, the, of that JSON object. Um, and then we're taking that, and we're returning that back to the language model with a prompt which says, please generate some mitigations, uh, and you'll see that we've got our list of suggested mitigations. So something that would probably take um, you know, my colleagues uh, and, and I a couple of hours to work through, and we've been able to do in a few minutes. Um, so that's, that's Stride GPT. Please give it a try um, and, and have a look at it. Um, I will just show you the prompt template so you can get an idea of how that looks uh, on the back end. So this is the one that we use for the threat model template. And you can see this is where all of the context in terms of you, know, you should act as a cybersecurity expert. We're really trying to tap into that idea of expertise and experience within the language model. Um, and then this is where we're capturing the parameters uh, that you'll that you'll have seen from the drop down boxes. All of that then gets uh, combined before it again it then gets uh, passed to the model. And you can see then I've I've advised it that it should provide it in a very specific output format, um, so that it's possible to to then go on and generate those mitigations uh, during that second step that I showed. Right, use case two. This one's quite interesting and was, sorry, question, yeah. Sorry, so, for the mitigations, are you just feeding its own scenarios back into the LLM generator? Yeah, so uh, if we went down to the mitigations um, template, that will again say, you know, you are a cybersecurity expert. Um, I can't quite remember what I put in there, but it would have been something similar to, again, tap into that idea of expertise and experience. Um, but otherwise, it would have been you know, generic, apart from the fact we've taken the threat list that it generated in the first stage, which is, again, based on um, the information that the user provided uh, about their application. Um, and, and that idea of passing um, information back through different instances of the model, this extends um, that idea, um, which is why I wanted to show it, um, because this is where we can actually take uh, different personas um, and use them to achieve uh, more than we can with just a single persona. Uh, so some key features to note here. Um, we're going to show a, a simulated conversation between two different AI personas. One is a, uh, a writer persona um, that's tasked with generating some security awareness content. And the second is an editor persona that will review and critique the output from the first, uh, from the first persona. And what that allows is, is two things, really. Um, we get some additional focus from the language model. So by just tasking each instance of the model with one job, 
uh, you allow it to specialize and focus a lot more and to produce a higher quality output. And we can also then create this iterative process of improvement that you'll see um, where you know, that reflection and critiquing um, hopefully leads to a better output than you would have got on the first uh, try around. And I'm not going to show it today, but one of the occasions I've used this was to write some code uh, for a, a simple web application. And if you ask ChatGPT to give you a code, to give you some code for a, a Flask web app, it will do it, but it will be very focused, um, unless you've told it otherwise, it will be very focused on the functional aspects of that web app. If, however, you combine that with a second persona that's a security reviewer, you get some quite interesting interactions because the security reviewer will start talking about things like cross-site request forgery tokens um, and you know, anti-DDoSing measures, which you would have never got from um, the, the, sort of the, the original persona by itself. So I think this is quite, um, quite powerful. Um, please, you know, again, the code's there. Go and play with it. It's very easy to customize. Have a quick flick through. Look at the different uh, persona descriptions look at the prompts that are set, look at the different goals, um, and you can tweak them to your, to your own ends, um, which, which makes it, I think, really, really powerful. Um, and obviously, we're using multiple personalities here, so there's a nod to uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, so you'll see this in the, in the code in a minute, but what you'll, what you'll witness is um, the user specifying a subject, um, and then we have this orchestrator Python script which first passes the subject and a prompt to the writer bot to say, go and write some content about this subject. Uh, the writer bot is then going to call the OpenAI API, which is then going to return some drafted content, which then gets passed over to the editor bot, which does its role um, using the prompt. And we'll go through a couple of iterations of that. Uh, so, this is um, fairly script orientated. Um, there's only a couple of uh, command line arguments that I'm passing in. So, one is the location of the, uh, the API key that I'm using, um, and then there's a, a subject that gets passed in as well, uh, which in this case, uh, DevSecOps best practices. And then uh, we'll start the, the conversation running between these two bots. This will take uh, a few seconds, so I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, it's, it's been pretty quick, though. No, OK. So this is then the first response that we've got from WriterBot. Um, and it's starting to write some security awareness material about our chosen subjects. Now we'll wait for editor bot to, to look at that. And then it will start to, we should have, yeah, some review comments. So it's then saying, you, know, you could benefit from more examples, further explanation. Um, you could emphasize certain aspects. And then, WriterBot is again coming back with a revised uh, piece, and it's actually providing some responses to EditorBot to tell it how it's addressed the original feedback. And then again, we're going into that second review cycle. Yeah, so it's identified point now. Point one now includes an example of implementing security as code. Um, and overall, the revised article is clearer, more informative. So I think EditorBot's pretty happy at this point. And then we have one more pass. So you can let this carry on indefinitely, um, but in my experience, it's better uh, to, to give yourself um, an exit point. Um, so we'll say yes. And then this is where we go into this final phase where we're taking the content that's been written by, edit, uh, by WriterBot um, and the latest version of that content. We're again putting it back to the OpenAI API model um, and we're saying draft um, a final piece um, and we want it in HTML um, just to provide some formatting in to, to make it a bit more visually interesting. 
Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so just, just for my understanding, you're saying you're using effectively two instances of open API and they're yep. just talking to each other. So the, yep. Um, using just two different profiles? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so there's, there's two instances set up. They're both uh, GPT 3.5 turbo. Um, it's just that the prompt templates we're using are different. And so when we're going through this phase, we're taking the feedback and the current version of the content. So basically like the chat history, effectively, and then sending it to that and saying, this is your latest feedback. Please respond to that, which it will it knows that it needs to do that. It goes through that writing process, and again, it then hands it back to EditorBot. Its prompt template says, you need to review this, and you need to provide a critique and update um, back. And then there's some logic in this script, which says, once you've done that a couple of times, we've been through enough uh, cycles. Give, give the user the option to exit at that point. Cool. Um, well, I, I think, but just to uh, enhance that, uh, are they both using the same open AI key in the same model? Yep. Okay, so have you tried splitting them, same one using ChatGPT 3.5 and another four, or the, uh, this project at the moment supports both to be the same? Um, so I did, I did try that with the coding bot because um, GPT-4 is, is generally better um, at coding. Um, so yes, you, you can absolutely vary that, and you'll be able to see in the code where that's called out and you know, it's fa fairly yeah, easy to update. Hi. Have you tried to use different models, like Claude uh, or anthrop Anthropomorphic, and tried, because the data set are different, and at different times, yeah. and specifically for big data sets, uh, for example, Claude has given me better result and feeling it back, retrained better the local tree of GPT-4 for specific thing, for example, classification or other stuff. Have you tried that? Uh, not something I've tried, but, but absolutely there's no reason why you couldn't do that because you would just, when you're creating your different uh, versions, you just tell one to use um, OpenAI, one to use Anthropic. There's no, yeah, no different, or even an open source model. That's, yeah, Lama, thank you. Yeah. One more question, one second. Sorry. Yep. Hi. Given ChatGPT's occasional propensity to, for lack of a better word, make stuff up, how much, how, what is your confidence that it's actually acting accurately upon this writing, editing, writing, editing cycle? Because like in my, from my own experience of using ChatGPT, it can write something that looks very convincing until you start digging down into it, and then you just realise it's, it's it's inventing stuff. And like, I mean, quite famously, some lawyers got rather burnt by it when it invented some previous cases that actually did not exist and had yeah. never existed, and they submitted it in court and got into quite a lot of trouble about it. Actually, how confident are you that it's actually ac being accurate with this? Um, editing. Um, so what, what, I'll, what I'll say is that yes, that is definitely an issue, and I, I said I wasn't going to talk about security risks, so I don't want to sort of break my own objectives. Um, there are some tips at the end that I'll, I'll cover um, that, that do help to address that. Um, this process, though, actually, in my experience, improves that problem, because you will have found that even just by asking ChatGPT, like, can you reflect on what you just gave me? It will go, oh no, of course I was wrong. Um, and in this instance, that's what the editor bot is doing or whatever reviewer persona you're doing, but you can automate that by having this kind of scripted approach. Um, so yes, I would still hazard that there are going to be inaccuracies in there. I have seen, for example, um, the editor bot will say, oh, it would be great if you had some, have some statistics in there. Well, of course, it's going to fabricate statistics because unless it's in the training data, it doesn't actually know. But again, the idea of these tools and the way I think of them is that 
it gives you 80% of what you need. So if you're somebody that needs to write an article for your security awareness newsletter on what DevSecOps is, this is going to give you 80% of the, the content in 1% you know, of the time. Um, so you know, your time is better spent fact-checking that, for want of a better term, um, and looking for those problems that you as a human can, uh, can pick up. Um, and then, so finally, we asked it for some uh, HTML output. And this is always interesting to see the, the colors it picks up. OK, it's pretty, pretty conventional. Um, but yeah, that, I, think that's, uh, I think I asked for that in Tailwind. Um, and it's done that. And so you can take that. You can provide your own templates. Obviously, you'd be more specific. You'd say, I want this specific block of HTML, this particular CSS. Um, and I think just on a scan, you know, it's done a fairly good job at nailing what we might want from a DevSecOps uh, piece of security awareness. Okay, uh, use case three. So this is where, in the last couple of weeks, um, I've really tried to explore what's possible um, when we stop using personas. We still, we still use personas, but this idea of um, autonomous agents um, that you might have seen. So there's like Auto GPT, um, a couple of others as well. The, the scope of those tools, in, in my opinion, is just too broad. Uh, at the moment, the, the models aren't powerful enough. But if you can narrow it down and, and give the, the model a specific set of tools to work with, um, you'll see, I think, that actually it, it's pretty compelling um, as, as a way of getting some work done. So what this demo does, um, the things to look out for, I'm going to provide a description of some scans that I want to perform as a security analyst or junior pen tester. Um, but I'm, I don't know any of the command line arguments that I need. I might even not even know the names of the tools that I actually need to run. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, the agent, based on the description, will look at, um, look at the intent uh, of, of the user, and it will decide which tools to run um, and the order that it's going to run them in, in order to achieve the, the goal that we've set it. Um, and as a bit of an insight into what the agent's uh, thinking, in inverted commas, um, there's, there's, some, uh, there's a section in this tool uh, that you can actually see the sort of decision-making process, uh, if we can call it that, um, going on, which I think is quite interesting. And when we think about sort of checking language models and the accuracy of their output, I think that type of feature is quite important so that you can have an expert look at uh, what the agents are doing and what the language models are doing and verify that. Okay, come back to that in a minute. Okay, another Streamlit app. Um, so this one. Uh, so, under the hood, what I've done is given the language models the ability to drive um, a shell, which is dangerous, uh, and I wouldn't recommend doing it on your own machine. So this is running on a digital ocean droplet, um, and it's targeting another digital ocean droplet in the same subnet, um, because that just cuts out any of the network latency problems. Um, and I also know that it's not going to go off and scan anything else. Um, so yeah, by all means, try out this similar approach at home. Um, but I wouldn't run it on your main computer, just in case the language model returns some interesting commands. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll just give it, um, uh, we'll say we want a very fast Nmap scan. And we'll run that. And then this is the, the section that you can see. So you see, right, we've got the, the T4 flag, so we want really quick, because that's what the user asked for. And you'll see, yeah, so in the th thought, since we need to perform a very fast Nmap scan, we should use the appropriate Nmap command that prioritizes speed. 
So I didn't need to know about the T4 flag, I didn't need to know about the F flag, um, it just went and, and picked that. But I can go and verify that through uh, providing this view of the, uh, the code. Uh, and then we get some, uh, some output uh, here, which says I've completed it and I found that uh, port 22 is open, 25 and port 80. So what we'll do is we'll clear those scan results out and we'll make this uh, a little bit more interesting for the model. So we'll say we want... Um, so, hmm. Okay, so I've not mentioned any tools. Um, I've cleared out the previous results, so at this point, the language model has no context. It doesn't know we performed that previous scan. It does know that it's got access to Nmap, because in the code I've said, if you need to run something called a network scan, use this tool. Um, and as you'll see, it's also got access to a couple of other tools as well. So this time, we didn't ask for a, a very fast scan, but we did ask for a network scan. So it's just running the basic Nmap command. And we know that it's going to find a web server because we're scanning the same target, and that had port 80 open. But it has identified again that port 80 is open. And so it's now going to run uh, a, web, uh, a web server scan using Nikto. So again, I didn't tell it which tools to use. I didn't tell it um, you know, anything about you know, how to structure the commands. Um, but it's performed that scan, and it's identified as Nikto is bound to do. Um, what's running on the, on the host. And then what we can do for that is we can take the output um, from both tools, and we can, again, pass that to the language model, get it to generate a nice uh, report for us um, that we can then say that our day of uh, junior pen testing is, is done for that day, um, and we can go to the pub. So just while that's generating, we'll go back to look at this process. So what, what you're seeing is um, we've described those scans. This, uh, so it's a Langchain agent. If any of you have played around with uh, any of these uh, frameworks that are used to interact with LLM, um, I think Langchain's a really good option for, for prototyping. Um, and it, it's that agent that's deciding, based on the, the prompt that we've given it or the description, which tools get used. It then sends um, it, it, the tool description or the tool that we've chosen to the OpenAI API. That will then say, okay, we want to run Nmap. We should use that TF flag or, uh, or sorry, T4 flag um, or anything else, depending upon the requirements. We then temporarily store those results, and at this point, the agent decides, did I meet all of the things that the user asked me for, or should I run another tool? And so that's what you saw in that second run, was that identified it still needed to complete the web application scan, and that's where it picked Nick to. And, I, and I've picked these tools because, um, for demo purposes, really, because they're really quick, um, and so we're not hanging around but there's no reason why you couldn't extend it to do you know, a full zap scan or, or anything like that. Um, so we're going through the final phase now, generating our reports. Again, we've seen it before a couple of times now, going to the, uh, the language model and providing a, a report in our chosen format, uh, which in this case is just uh, straight back to Streamlit. Uh, so this is where we're seeing it's identified um, some of the issues, it's describing our methodology, and it's giving us some recommendations. And again, you should absolutely fact check this. Um, you should verify it, run your own scan, look at the results. Um, this isn't replacing any pen testers anytime soon, um, but I'm hoping that things like this will make people a lot more efficient when it comes to reporting and just cranking the handle on day-to-day -day tasks that, that we need to do. Okay. 
Yeah, question. Thank you. Um, my question has to do with uh, the data that is imported into ChatGPT. I mean, that is, I mean, I think that you get uh, a warning that you should not be putting anything there because it could, it could leak. So it, it has more to do with privacy, I suppose. It's like how effective it can be, those tools can be used if, if there is the knowledge that it can be you know, stored, that the information that you're putting in there could be, could be stored. Yeah, um, so I, I think your question was about the privacy concerns of using things like the open AI, like closed source model, um, sending it off to like a third party. How, how dangerous yeah, it yeah, is to abs put the, uh, real life uh, yeah. IP addresses and uh, vulnerabilities. Yeah. Um, so I think that's down to your individual risk appetite for your organization. Um, you know, my employer, we're, we're not using uh, OpenAI directly. Um, we don't have a commercial relationship with them. Um, but we do have access to other services. Um, that we can use you know, language models on, and they've already got that commercial cover, the, the confidentiality agreements, etc. Um, you can also uh, use things like um, Hugging Face, which I, you might not have come across. Um, Hugging Face is like the GitHub of machine learning. Um, so if you want an open source model, you can find it on Hugging Face. They've got loads of different data sets and models that are trained for different purposes. Um, and you can take those and deploy them onto a service like uh, Amazon SageMaker. Um, and that way you know that you're only talking to a model that you're hosting on your own infrastructure. Um, and it may not be quite as good as the, or quite as capable um, as the GPT models, um, but you'll be addressing concerns about giving those actual scan results to a third party that you don't have a commercial relationship with. Um, so, having shown some use cases, um, I wanted to uh, sort of give you some ideas about how, how I think about um, identifying use cases and how hopefully you can um, do the same. So, the first thing, and this is my favorite way of thinking about it, is imagine I said, I've got a brand new intern for you, what would you have them do? And Again, this, I like the idea of the intern because it's not your best red teamer. It's not going to be your most experienced security architect. Um, it, it has, you know, it's really good at written English and it's pretty good at sort of verbal uh, reasoning. Um, but it's going to need some supervision. And so you know, tasks that you can give to an intern to make your life easier, those are you know, ideally suited um, for large language models and, and generative AI. All the better if they're repetitive and tedious tasks that people get bored of and lose focus on, but AI doesn't lose focus um, if, you're, if your prompts are, are engineered correctly. Um, because that's where you can really start to drive that automation. Um, I'd also say that you know, don't look for ways to replace people. Um, you know, as we've already touched on already, the language models aren't capable, really. They will hallucinate, they will generate strange uh, outputs. Um, but what they can do really well is to make processes and teams work faster. Um, and so you should be looking for opportunities to, to augment your existing teams with AI rather than thinking, you know, I'm going to replace uh, a particular resource or a type of resource within my business. Uh, and I'd also like, like any um, technology initiative, particularly when it's at this phase of uh, sort of emerging technology, um, definitely start small with a well-defined use case. Uh, I think it's tempting to, you know, once your imagination's fired, think that's great, I'm going to start you know, scanning everything in my estate, I'm going to pull together all of these reports. Um, but I mean, it's much easier if you start with a, a small well-defined use case and just use that as a a springboard to demonstrate within your own organizations um, how well uh, AI can do it at some of these tasks. So when you come to um, implementing uh, those use cases, um, 
I definitely say again, you know, start with the non-critical ones. Um, again, this idea of you know, start small, don't use anything critical. Um, you know, less sensitive data or certainly non-sensitive data would be ideal. We definitely have uh, human in the loop reviews. Um, so we've talked about this already. Um, I could have taken those uh, those tools to the next level. Um, I could have had the report finalized and emailed to the client. Um, everything could have been handled by, by the AI, um, but you, you probably want a human in that process to just do the final check before you hit the send button. Um, if you're making decisions using, uh, or as part of your use cases, um, definitely monitor closely for bias. Um, the models, the general models that you'll get, so like um, Claude or the GPT models, um, the vendors there have done a lot of work to try and remove um, the biases from, from those outputs. But if you're using uh, a more specific model, so again, something from Hugging Face, for example, that's been trained on a quite a small set of data, and you ask it a topic of some you know, slightly related but not entirely uh, aligned to what it's designed to output, um, you can get some pretty funky outputs. Um, and you, you don't want to be making decisions on the back of that model's output. So it's, again, it's important to have that human in the loop. It's important to be monitoring for, uh, for bias in the output. I'd also say to you know, understand how these things work, document your processes, good engineering principles, um, and track your performance. Um, there's a really interesting tool that's just been released by the same team that developed Langchain. Um, so they're calling it Langsmith. And with uh, a couple of um, environment variables um, and a separate API key, you can actually get a view of what Langchain is doing behind the scenes. Um, and it will even give you things like the latency of the calls, and you can see why your model is performing slowly. Um, so that's, that's a really interesting tool that's only come out in the last uh, couple of weeks. And I'd expect to see more of those types of tools emerge as more organizations look to operationalize and, and put into production um, these types of uh, technologies. Uh, I'd also say it's key to be transparent about the use of AI, um, particularly when you're using it as the front door, perhaps, to your security function. It's one of the use cases that we've talked about internally. Um, we'd like to provide a consistent point of interaction for the security team. Uh, to direct you to the correct team. Um, but we're not going to pretend that that's a human um, because you, you're not trying to trick users, even though it's, you, know, you might want to make it seamless. Um, it's far better to be upfront. And I think people are generally accepting of, of what um, the intention is of the teams that are implementing these technologies. Um, and so you might as well just be transparent about it. Um, when you're implementing the tools, um, I definitely keep track of the metrics as well. So when you've got those particular use cases, you know, look at how many tickets you're resolving in a day using generative AI. Look at how many of your um, dev projects now have completed threat models for them. Um, it all helps to sort of prove the, the value um, of, of this technology. Um, once you start to get into it, though, I think it's quite easy to over-rely on some of the outputs. Um, again, that idea of the human in the loop interaction, not just taking everything the model produces as gospel, um, is really important. And I think for security professionals, that might come a bit more naturally than, than colleagues elsewhere in the business who see technology and expect it to work. Um, you know, this is a really interesting, cutting edge area of, of computer science. Um, and I think it's easy to look at it and go, it, it's, it's infallible, um, and it's not. You know, we, we already we know this from um, again from the the OWASP top ten that's come out this week, um, and you know, I definitely don't see this technology going away. Um, I think it's important that all organisations, if you're not already doing so, start to develop your own internal AI experts, um, because the real value from these technologies doesn't come from the um, the sort of chat GPT, general knowledge answering, it's when you start to explore those specific use cases and start to use this technology to address the specific pain points within your business. And you're obviously people that need to know your business 
and uh, know how to use these models in order to, to realize that to, to the full extent. Uh, so I'll finish up and ask if anyone's got any questions. Thank you very much for an amazing talk, Matt. Let's give you a big round of applause. Thank you. Question. Go for it. Hi. Uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Quite nice. I was wondering, could you describe any sort of difficulties you might have in implementing your uh, implementing? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so I will just dive into some of the code because I think that's quite instructive. Um, so you can sort of see how much effort goes into pointing the language model down the right direction and turning it from a generalist into a specialist. So we've got you know, three different things. We're asking. When it's producing an attack tree, we want it using Mermaid. Um, mitigations template, again, you know, we're dropped in that thing. And, and that's where the main challenges have come from, is that, like I said earlier, one of the, uh, the interesting things about running live demos like this is that you, you never get the same output twice. It would be like if I, you and I sat down to write a report and we had the same starting information, we might broadly have the same headers in the document, but when it comes down to the individual wording or how we structure the tables, it's going to be different. If I give you more instructions and I give both of us more instructions and say, I specifically want these three columns in those tables and I want you to provide you know, bullet points that cover these things, um, then we get a lot more consistency in the output. And that's really where most of my time is spent, um, is refining um, the, the prompts and, and yeah, the, the flows between the different um, tools. So I think there's, you know, you end up with some interesting, um, so that's just another prompt template, but I'll show you like the, the editor role. Uh, apologies, this is gonna be one long string. Um, so we've been very clear, you know, your role is to critique and improve security awareness materials. You should always analyze, and, and oh, did I say always? No, you should analyze the content. I will often use things like words like always and be definitive. You must do this um, because, again, it's pushing the model to understand that you, you really do want it done um, and that it doesn't have wiggle room. Um, otherwise, it will uh, eventually find a way to, to provide that wiggle and something will break in the, in the, in the output. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's sort of where the challenges have mostly lain, um, and, and yeah, a bit of an idea. But again, please look at the code, and you'll, you'll sort of see how things uh, get built up. Yeah, we have another question at the back. One second. Hi. Um, so assumingly, I said that I gave ChatGPT or GPT three uh, GPT three point five instructions to follow um, a CRM let's say, with certain data, what's the likelihood of it or, um, ignoring my instructions and answering another question? Like answering the same, that question, but ignoring the, the, the fact that I have certain, um, certain data to follow first. Yeah, um, so uh, you, you, uh, yeah, you, you, you're talking about um, stuff that's technically known as um, retrieval augmented generation or RAG. So that's where you provide a custom knowledge base and you really only want answers from that knowledge base. You don't want it to interpret or, or hallucinate something else. Uh, sorry, ex excuse me, like, because I, I'm not t I'm non-technical. That's why yep. no, that's I fine. asked but yeah. like for my team, for the tech team. I'm just asking to keep in touch with it. Yeah, so, so absolutely. So um, that's where, again, you can you use the, the prompts um, the system prompts that aren't seen by the user, um, and I'm not I'm not doing it in here because it's not particularly critical. Um, but I've worked with I've developed other tools where I'll say, you know, you must only reply with answers from that knowledge base. If you don't know, say that you don't know, and it's a really simple thing to say, and it's something that you, know, you would converse with a human about. Um, Language models are a really different way of interacting with computers. 
Um, and so things like that, while they're simple, they do make a tremendous difference to the output. And that, and that problem of hallucination, um, again, it, it, it's really improved by just in adding those simple phrases. Um, and again, test, you know, keep testing. Um, and th there are some good services out there, um, like the OpenAI service on Azure, for example. They've now given you the ability to upload your own documents to that. And you can, you can test it out. And you know, one of my things is I'll say, um, I'll ask a few questions about the data. And I'll say, you know, why is the sky blue? Who is the current president, or, uh, yeah, current president of the US? And what you want is not for it to have a go. You want it to come straight back and say, I don't know, it's not part of the data set. Um, and so those, those tests are really key before you start pushing out to a, a wider group of users. Great, thanks. Any more questions? No? Okay, thank you very much for the great talk. And uh, just a reminder that this is an open source project, so all these uh, wonderful uh, tools you can find in uh, Matt's repo. Which yeah, is so on if, if you, right now. Yeah. All you need uh, is just the open AI key, is that right? The API key. Uh, yes, yeah, so for, this, for the Streamlit app, so if you go to the, the GitHub um, repos, you'll see the public repos that are there. Um, they've got full instructions on how to use each of the tools, um, and yeah, you can have a play around with them. Um, feel free to, to reach out to me as well on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, just uh, thanks, thanks very much for, for coming on and listening. Fantastic. Thank you very much.